as we are here, which is why I just so love this situation, get on with you all. You know, we move mountains, and we're proud of that, you know. We love it. Good work, good honest work. So, rivers of timber, that's actually all hornbeam, which is extremely hard. Yeah, they call it ironwood, I'm sure you have your own ironwood here. Or similar things, you know, that you call that. Yeah, they make um, gymnasium floors with it. Yeah, it only just floats. Um, extremely, extremely hard. Uh, oh yeah, they make gears for windmills and water mills. The actual teeth of the gears are made out of hornbeam. Yeah, very, very tough material. So we're loading, um, okay, this one here actually is an example of how the coppice, after it's been cut, this is hazel coppice, which produces very small, round, uh, long, slender, very small diameter round sticks for many different products, which I'll demonstrate here. One of the products is for making stakes to bind these hedgerows. Yeah, in our country, we still have a tradition of live hedgerow board um, fencing. Yeah, they're thorny hedges, and they're halfway cut through the stem of one of these trees and laid over and bound in with these stakes. It produces a stock-proof fence. Yeah, and I've done a lot of that as well, and beautifully, I'll tell you what, it's, it's such hard work and you get thorns in your head and thorns in your butt, you get thorns everywhere, <coughs> but you know that you're standing on a boundary that could potentially be 25,000 years old, that boundary. Because when man went from hunter-gatherer to farmer-settler, yeah, he had to make boundaries to keep his livestock in, and that's how he did it. And those boundaries move subtly over the years. And weirdly enough, actually, in Cornwall, where they don't have, the trees don't grow the way they do in the other parts of the country, they use stone walls on top of banks that are ditch, ditched, and they're still called hedges, even though they have no hedge on them. Yeah? Anyway, sorry, I digress. I've got to move on. Um, so that's what it looks after it's been cut. <coughs> and this is what it looks like when it starts to grow back. And the beauty of the coppice regime is because you get so many shoots coming up so quickly, it actually absorbs more sunlight than any mature tree could. Yeah, you get all these young plants and it creates all sorts of marginal areas, so it creates what we call extremely high level of biodiversity, which is fantastic. We have all sorts of rare plants and animals. These are examples. I'm not an expert on flowers. I should have noted down what these are called. But we have all sorts of species of invertebrates, which are butterflies and beetles, and flowers and birds that survive off this, and they survive off the regime itself. They are niche. If we don't cut the coppice, yeah, those species are eradicated. Yeah, they actually survive on that regime. So that's why it's so important that we continue the process. Unfortunately, it's not done enough, yeah, and it's left to go to high canopy forests, which is not biodiverse. Yeah? So that's why my mission is to create new products and new markets for this small diameter wood. Here's, a, here's a, head, a, a hedge after it's been laid freshly. You can see how it actually looks like a fence, but it's a living object. Yeah? And this is a dead hedge. Well, it's not a dead hedge, it's a fence. It's a wattle fence. Yeah? And this is the hazel rods woven for a, into a fence. We've got more products here. We've got a bisson broom, which is classic witch broom. And we have a yew longbow, which again is part of our great history. Um, yew was actually coppice, that's why you can make bows out of it. They don't mill it out of the big block or cut, um, split it. Because the bow has to have equal sapwood and heartwood to get the spring compression correct. One compresses, one works well under tension. So you make uh, grow coppice poles for that. More products, garden, that's a rose arch, very traditional. It's a woven arch form. And of course, this is sweet chestnut that was brought to our country by the Romans. Uh, for nuts for the, for the troops, grows quickly, easy to cut. The great thing about coppice is you don't need a chainsaw. Yeah, you just cut it with a hand tool, very easy. To harvest, that's another reason to grow it small. Uh, this is split chestnut. I'm sure you have chestnut here. It's, we call it poor man's oak. Uh, it's full of tannic acid, so it's quite durable. Um, you may think, what's this all relevant, actually, to sculpture? The point being, it's all about green woodworking to me. You know, simple techniques like this fencing is traditional to burn the bottom of the post before you put it in the ground. I'm sure you all know that.
but quite often it rots off at ground level and you've got to take it out because you want to put another one in maybe you get it out and the, the bit in the ground is fine it's where it where the moisture content was just right at the surface that's where it rots off but I burn a lot of my work as you see as you go along and I've discovered it is it's more than just bringing out the surface of a texture yeah, I'm actually chemically and physically changing the nature of the surface of that wood. To yeah, what and it goes, do you burn it? Sorry? To what degree do you burn it? I burn it intensely. I use... Uh, Elaine's let me borrow her burning lamp here. I'm hiding uh, over here. You're hiding over there. I went, wow, this is a blow lamp. It's fierce. It's fantastic. It just incinerates the most sopping wet wood that I've got. I don't actually know what species it is that I've got. But it's just fibre and water, that's all it is. <laughs> but I burn it intensely, and then I remove the charcoal. But there is a tradition in several <coughs> countries, I've, I've researched Japan, where they, they burn intensely cedar boards that are cladding for buildings, and that, that, those layers of charcoal, and then the interface layers of uh, sort of baked hard resins, you know, and you get all these layers, if you like. And it's like almost like naturally varnishing the wood with its own juice. Yeah, with this heat treatment. And those cedar boards last for hundreds of years. It's amazing. And it's all done with the material. That's it. Material is the source. Yeah, for me, it's all about the properties of the material. Yeah, and it's life as an organic being. When I take on a sculpture, like I said, it's a meditation. And I, I, I have to enter into the spirit of that piece of wood. And as I discovered on the piece I'm working now, I had a terrible day two days ago. I made a committal cup. You know, we all do it, yeah, and you spend the rest of the time trying to work around that. You know? <coughs> oh, it's a mistake. But of course, you know, but the idea is there's no such thing as a mistake. It's that first cut business again. You only have the limitation of what you have left. And it's taking you to another place, and you've got to believe that where it's taking you is the right place. Everything is as it should be. It wants to be something else, but you have to readjust your vision to find it. I digress again. Let's move on, because we have got a lot to show you, actually. Lots of what we call rustic products. Yeah, again, more palin fencing. They used to make miles and miles of this stuff. They just don't anymore. Uh, it's all softwood panels from Scandinavia, which are all harvested timber. Although, having said that, they have a very good regime of sustainability in Scandinavia. Beautifully managed woodlands. In France and a lot of Europe, you know, they really do do this well. And I'm sure you all do it here as well. You know, it's so good. There's so many people doing good things. This is charcoal making in the woods. Would have been done on site, just like you guys. We go out and do stump jobs. Everything's done on site. It's, it's, a, it's a good way of life. <coughs> Traditional charcoal burners. And this, again, is my experience of pyrolytic um, processing of wood. You know, there's a whole science to that. Traditional oak framing, which is where I enter as a sculptor. I sculpt in oak, and uh, I use it because it's plentiful in my county, it's large, and it's durable. <coughs> but there are disadvantages to it. One, it's extremely tough, and when I'm doing large ripping cuts, it almost, by the end of the day, I am completely dead. My wrists are dropping off. But another thing it does is it poisons me because it's full of tan tannic acid, which is how you tan leather and preserve it. Well, I'm preserving my lungs and my body and it rots my skin. So, I w I've, early on, I decided to wear full breathing apparatus. And I, uh, I just don't not use it anymore. And I didn't realize how much damage I was doing until I got this equipment. And when I'm tempted to, to work without it, even for a few minutes, that night my sinuses are absolutely stuffed full of crap, basically. I feel terrible. Well, this is a commercial blower. It's a very cheap one, actually. It only cost me 200 which is about $300, I guess. I say cheap. It was a lot of money to me. I'm a sculptor. So, um, but I bought it and it had, a, it had a hood with it, with a basic sort of uh, plastic visor that had rippled in it. It was so thin. I was like, my God, how can you work with that? So I then reinvented it and put a polycarbonate visor onto it but it just kept falling apart and falling apart. So to come here, I wanted, funnily enough, to stand out from the crowd. And I thought, I'm gonna do what I've been planning for years, which is to reinvent the helmet. 
and this is what I made. I made a vacuum forming machine uh, to make the bubble and the great thing about the bubble is unlike the other hood where I always felt claustrophobic. Yeah, I've got full peripheral vision. Um, for me, the best thing about it is I look like a superhero or some kind of alien. <laughs> you know, which, um, yeah, love that bit. Uh, I don't know if you saw, I had a little video at the beginning of me working. I do time lapse photography of nearly all my work, if I can. It's very time consuming, which is another reason why I'm a slow and steady worker. There's Bob King, uh, did a brilliant lecture last year that I watched on YouTube. He was talking about the diversity of cutters and their different styles. I do not produce a lot, and I do it for my passion, you know, and I'm not a rich man, but I love my life, and I'm going to stay doing this until I'm 85, <laughs> so I wear this, and these are airport air defenders, you know, they're the highest rating, whereas most proprietary lids, they have their own uh, air defenders that aren't as good, so I wanted to keep these, and this just fits on here, like that. I've got full vision. Yeah, I'm very comfortable for the first time. I don't know if you can hear that. I'm shouting now. <laughs> right. For the first time, I actually feel comfortable doing it. You know, brilliant. That was the best investment I've made this year. And it's made out of a piece of chip. Sorry? Well, I could do. I could do. I'm not here to sell the idea. I'm here to pass the idea on. For me, like I said, this event's all about exchange. You know? I'm not here to make a buck out of you guys. Christ, you've got no more money than I have. You know, it's, I want you to stay alive. Just like me. So I'm welcome. I really want to move on because I've got a lot to show you. And I, I, I'm all...